you. Today I want to talk about transsexualism, but I want to talk specifically about an idea which is often raised uh, in reference to transsexualism, which is called internalized homophobia. Now, this is a very important concept to get to grips with, and we're going to spend some time on it. But before I get there, I want to have a little word about context, because this has become increasingly an issue. Now, I can't remember which one of that wonderful duo, Gilbert and George, who were uh, performance artists of the 1960s and 70s, I can't remember which whether it was Gilbert or George who said, context is everything. Now, funnily enough, in the visual arts, context is not everything. It's absolutely the opposite, in fact. Art has got an internal, innate value system. Everybody knows what good art is. So Gilbert and George were wrong there. But in many other parts of life, this idea that context is everything has become absolutely central to our thinking. It's a core part of postmodernism which understands that there are no absolutes. You know, everything is relative. And so the context is always really important. Now, why is that important to the discussion of transsexuals and internalized homophobia? Well, earlier this week I had a, on a Twitter spat with a person called Dr. Amitai, Oren Amitai, his name is. Dr. Amitai has much in common with a number of other, uh, shall we call professional psychologists, clinical psychologists, working in this or related fields, right? And they present themselves as being expert. They always do. They are, they, that's, that's what they consider themselves to be because, you know, they call themselves professors. They're not actually, they're, they're university lecturers. A professor is actually someone who chairs a department. But, you know, this is the language they use to try and demonstrate their authority. But what they never tell you is that their opinions come entirely from a postmodernist standpoint. Now you see, Gilbert and George, whether it's Gilbert or George, they made that statement around about 1969. And by that time, the corruption of certain disciplines within academia were, was already well underway. Um, the attack had already commenced. Okay? And now we come forward, you know, nearly 50 years in the future, and postmodernism is de facto the context within which the entirety of the humanities, the arts, and the social sciences are being discussed in academia, in the West End. It's, there is no other viewpoint allowed. They are all completely coming from that standpoint. And there's a very few who reject this, people like uh, Camille Padilla, Jordan Peterson, but they're, they're they, you know, you can't count them on one hand. Everybody else is singing from the same song sheet. Now, this song sheet includes things like that left is good, that left is progress, and that everything that is left-wing is a good thing, and everything that is conservative is a bad thing. Right? Now, this is really quite an important idea to grasp. When you see someone like Dr. Oren Am Amitai saying that transsexuals exhibit and I put this in quotes, internalized homophobia, what does that mean? You understand that uh, Oren Amitai is talking from this postmodernist standpoint, which is the hegemony in the West, academic hegemony in the West today. I mean, today you even have university lecturers being told that they can't actually teach unless they pass things like uh, microaggression tests. And if they're found to have failed the postmodernist um, standards in any way at all. They have to be re-educated. You know, it's straight out of 1984, this. There's nothing good about this at all. And academia has swallowed this all up whole. And it is now trying its damnedest to push it out into the broader society so that we all buy the bullshit. And it is bullshit. Now, at the same time that postmodernism was becoming really important in academia, the modern LGB movement was being formed. At the same time, second wave feminism appeared. Now you have to understand that postmodernism is an intellectual reworking of Marxian communism, Marxian socialism. Marxian theory is just 
changed from being um, a materialist dialect, materialist dialectic with two groups, that is the owners of the means of production and the, everyone else who are the oppressed, the proletariat, within postmodernism this is broken down into many, 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 many groups of oppressed people, right? But there's always only ever one oppressor and that's straight white men. That's basically what postmodernism is. It's a way to try to turn it all around so that we move away from the, the old-fashioned uh, accusation of the owners of the means of uh, production and we just say, well, it's, it's straight white guys, they're the problem. So, within or under the postmodernist umbrella, you had things like feminism. Well, feminism also completely condemns white men. I mean, you just have to look around the internet today and you'll see that the principal attack for feminists is white men like me. They hate me. They detest us. They want rid of us. We want us to not exist. Right? At the same time, you've got the LGB movement. What do they want? They want the end of straight white men as well. They want rid of us. Why do they want rid of us? Because we represent conservative values in society. We say, wait a minute, we think people should stand on their own two feet. We think that families should be nuclear with a, mother, a, a father, a mother, and a number of children living in one household until the kids are old enough to fend for themselves. Right? We don't believe that the state should take on the role of parents. To start with, that's a beginning, but it's much, much wider than that. So, from the point of view of postmodernists, we are detested. And from the point of the LGB community, we are also detested because they see us as rejecting their worldview. Now, the fact is that homosexuality and transsexualism have always existed. We can go back thousands of years. We actually now have prehistoric evidence from Eastern Europe uh, that could be construed quite reasonably to suggest that uh, transsexualism existed 30, 40,000 years ago. And you find that in, say, the Red Lady, uh, the, the Red Lady of Pavilan is actually a guy but buried as a woman roughly 35,000 years old. This has always been with it, but it's only in the 1960s that we see it developed into what I call new gay man culture, that is this modern LGB take on life. And central to the LGB take on life is that it's right. There, there is only one way of seeing things and it's their way. You know, postmodernism basically says this. It says, all points of view are all equally valid. All cultures are all equally valid. But that can only be understood from within the postmodernist mindset, right? So it's very similar to the way that East Germany, for example, before the fall of the, the Iron Curtain, called itself the Deutsche Democratic Republic, the German Democratic Republic. Well, sure, it was democratic. You could vote for anybody you liked, as long as they were a communist, right? Same with the old Henry Ford story. You could have a Ford in any color you wanted as long as it was black. You know? So there is no democracy in a system like that, yet there is choice. It's a very strange thing. And from the postmodernist perspective, you're not allowed to think anything out with postmodernist thinking. You have to stay within it. And if you are within it, then your ideas are as valid as anybody else's within it. What are not valid are the conservative values on which, by the way, our culture is founded because they don't accept postmodernism. I don't accept postmodernism. I think it's bullshit. So I'm hated. Now, how does this apply to transsexuals and why is Amitai's statement so pernicious? Well, to recap a little bit, Anyone arguing from the postmodernist standpoint must immediately attempt to undermine his opponent's position if that opponent is arguing from without, out with the postmodernist mindset. So, in this exchange with Amitai, one of the things he did was accuse me of having opinions that I did because I like to uh, have sex or to like to, to have romantic relationships with trans women. And I say to him, yeah, so the fuck what? Can you show me? a so-called queer theorist who sits firmly within the postmodernist post doctrine, a queer theorist who is not himself or herself actively pursuing members of their own sex. 
Can you show me one? Name one. One. Only one. But for them, that's okay. You can be gay and write about queer theory. You can be gay and have opinions about being homosexual. But if you're outside postmodernism, no, 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 no. You're not allowed to have, to be, you're not allowed to make comment on what is right or wrong about anything because you are not working within their approved rules. And that's what that was about. That's what Amitai's attempt there to smear me was all about. It was saying, you're not playing by my rules and you better shut up because I'm going to kick you. Now, let's get back to the issue of internalised homophobia. I read a paper which was written in, in 2014. Now, this is a doctoral thesis, but it's published, so this person actually got their PhD. And I just want to read something from it, because this really does encapsulate the postmodernist mindset that people like Amitai, Zucker, and the others are all speaking from. And here it is. It's fascinating, really. It is. Uh, the writer says, I, rec I recognize, he's talking about, um, the writer is writing, talking about, what he calls the, she calls the transgender movement, or queer theory, says, as I recognize their theoretical and political importance in destabilizing the male-female binary and normative sexuality. Right, now, why would you put that into a doctoral thesis? Well, I'll tell you why you put that into a doctoral thesis. You do it so that you pass your doctorate, because it says to all the people who are reading it, I'm on your side. I want to be one of the ones who's destabilizing the binary. I want to be one of the ones who's rejecting normative sexuality as if there was ever any other kind of sexuality. Do you see what I mean? That is why context is important. That is the context. She set out the context of the whole paper. She says, this paper is not going to challenge the essential concepts of the postmodernist movement within academia because I set out with you to destabilize, destabilize the male-female binary and normative sexuality. And that is just stated, and it's going to be accepted, just accepted, as gospel. Why is it a good thing to destabilize the male-female binary? What is wrong with the male-female binary? Answer, nothing, unless you happen to be a postmodernist feminist, right? This comes from Marx. Postmodernism, remember, is just another iteration of Marxian ideas. Marx wanted to see the, the, the nuclear family destroyed, and he realized that in order to do that, he had to destroy traditional sex roles that applied within marriage. He had to get rid of them. And that's what the postmodernists are doing. That's what they want to do. That's why, if you want a PhD, you have to suck their bottoms. You have to say, mm, yeah, you know, I'm on your side. I, I, I think it's terrible, you know, this binary. It's a terrible thing. We've got to get rid of it. Here's the thing. Homosexual transsexuals are not interested in destabilizing the binary. They're not interested in getting rid of normative sexuality. They have perfectly normative sexuality themselves. Um, a male transgender homosexual, that is, a feminine gay man, gay boy, has female sexuality. She doesn't want some intermediate sexual form. She just wants to be a woman. She just wants to exercise that female sexuality in the conventional conservative manner. And that is in the sense of playing the woman to the man to whom she's attracted. Okay? But you have to understand that within this weird, wacky world of postmodernism, that's not allowed, that's not an opinion you're allowed to have. Because that's conservative. You're not allowed to do that. No, 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 no. No, no, that's not allowed. You're, not, you're allowed to have any sexuality you want as long as it's not a normative one. Okay? As long as your sexuality does not challenge what these people want to prescribe for you. Now, since the 1960s, we have seen immense pressure placed on feminine homosexual males, that's transgender homosexuals, to not be feminine. And the, the pressure is massive. You know, I have so many emails here from people in this position who are, 
who are terrified. If they, if, they are, if they present as they want to present, they will be ostracized by the gay community and they'll get brickbats from the straight community. Who, to whom can they turn? Nobody. They can go nowhere. They're basically eliminated from society by the mainstream society, but also by the new gay man LGBT hegemony. We'll get back again to the 60s and the work with John Money. You'll see many papers from Money in which he references this idea that as far as he can see, uh, homosexuality, and we're talking about male homosexuality here, was caused by some sort of imbalance in uh, testosterone that was delivered in the womb. So that basically, the, the, the fetus did not masculinize the way it should, and that this, consist, this persisted into uh, childhood and adulthood. Now, money had some other ideas that got him in a lot of trouble, um, which was that basically that um, gender identity could be shaped in the, or, or conditioned in the sort of pre-five-year-old age range. Um, and unfortunately, he didn't seem to realize that gender is actually a function of sexuality. So if sexuality is affected or conditioned by the way that your um, hormone balance is delivered in womb, then your gender follows that. And unfortunately, money didn't seem to understand that, and that's caused him, that caused him eventually to lose his career. I don't think he was an evil man. I think he was um, a misunderstood and mistaken man. But to leave that aside, what we're saying is that HSTS, in fact, transgender homosexuals of all types, are not the same as other males. Intrinsically, sorry, the rain started, so it's going to get a bit of noise for the rain. They are intrinsically not the same. They are shifted towards the feminine on a whole range of parameters, including their sexuality. And what an HSTS wants to do is to fit in society in the way that her sexuality demands. That is, to be a woman. Now what the postmodernists and people at Amitai are trying to suggest is that, no, 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 what she should do is accept that she's a boy. Now, these people can't live as boys. They suffer tremendously. I've already told you that the, uh, the transgender homosexuals get absolute hell from the gay movement as well as from conservative religion people, you know. So they have no place in society. The only place they do have is just to be women. And that's probably the best thing that any of them could do. Because as soon as a transgender homosexual transitions into women, that person's gender dysphoria vanishes. And all transgender homosexuals, and I don't care what they tell you, have got some level of gender dysphoria, every single one of them. Now, when go back and going back to people like Amitai and Zucker, people like that, but these people are profoundly intellectually dishonest because they pretend that uh, it, is, it is neutral for a young individual, no experience of the world, no real ability to express herself or his himself in, uh, in any way, in any real articulate way at all, at 13 or 14 years old, that it's reasonable for a qualified mind bender, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, who's maybe 30 or maybe older, to every week, for hours every week, be delivering this sermon about how they just have to accept the bodies, be boys, you'll be boys, you'll be fine, accept all of that. And he suggests that this is a neutral environment for development. Well, it's not. That's just a lie. It's just a lie. And the sooner we realize that lie exists, the better. The interference of men like Luther in the lives of young people is totally negative. All right? Trying to convince HSTS, young HSTS, that they're better off being gay boys, is a ludicrous and immoral and I consider abusive use of power. And they should not be allowed to do it. They need to stop. No, I'm not running around saying that every gender non-conforming kid is next necessarily homosexual transsexual. I'm not saying that at all, and I never have before anybody starts with more smears. I have never said that. What I am saying is that by the time a child is 14, you can say with reasonable accuracy, 13 to 15 say, but reasonable accuracy, say, say 18 months after puberty, with reasonable accuracy, you can tell that, that whether that child will be HSTS or not. And remember, that child is going to be transgender or homosexual, whatever you do. All you're arguing about here is whether that 
person pretends to be a boy, if he's male, or whether that person ends up being a woman. There's no advantages to these people in being a boy. They will have to enter into a gay lifestyle which is notorious for dangerous behaviour, risky behaviour, transmission of STDs, substance abuse, uh, emotional abuse, you name it, across the, the field, anybody who, is, uh, who dares to, uh, male, any male but feminine homosexual, who dares to express their femininity, will be shouted down and attacked and ostracised. You know, the, the, the mainstream conservative culture might try to beat the gay out of these people, the gay people will try and mock the gay out of these people. And they're saying that this is a reasonable thing to do. But it's not. It just isn't. So, from the point of view of the gay boy, what is the possible advantage here? What's important is sexuality, not sex. Right? And you have to get these different. Sexuality usually maps onto sex accurately and there's no problem. In some individuals, it doesn't. But from the point of view of the persona, of how you're going to be in society, the sexuality is far more important than sex. The place is full. I mean, I live in the Philippines. This place is full of trans women who have penises and they don't think anything twice about it. It's fair enough, I have a cock. You know? I'm still a girl. It's not a problem. And this is not postmodernist thinking. This is just them accepting that their sexuality conditions what their social role and therefore gender will be. Okay? What people like Amitai is they produce this entirely false, false correlation and call it science, which says that, no, no, you're born with it, so you must be a boy. So you have to put up with whatever everybody else does to you, but you just still have to just be a boy. You know, don't be a girl. Whatever you do, don't be a girl. No, it's bullshit. It's such utter bullshit. Because what's important is sexuality. So these people think that it's better to produce lots of unsatisfied, unhappy, dysphoric, uh, non-functional young males instead of perfectly happy, high-functioning, content trans women. They think the former is better than the latter. And the reason is, they know that trans women, that is HSTS here, we're talking about true transsexuals, the ones who are actually transsexual, completely destroy the entirety of queer theory, LGB theory, and they, they, they destroy postmodernism itself. Because they say, Actually, some things are intrinsic. Sexuality is intrinsic, and therefore so is gender. Right? That's what their, their, their sheer existence, I wrote many years ago, the sheer existence of transsexuals drives a coach and horses through the whole of queer theory and contemporary academic thinking. It destroys it. And as a result, the academics themselves have circled the wagons in a blatant attempt to fight it off, to say, no, 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 we're not having that. You're not allowed to come along and destroy this in this great ivory tower of bullshit that we have created in academia that says this, that, and the other. You know, it's context, yes, in academia, context absolutely is everything. But you have to understand that the reason that that person put what she did in her uh, thesis tells you exactly what academia is about. It, they're all liars, certainly in the, the humanities, the arts, and the social sciences, it's based on conforming to what other people have already said, right? If you can stand up your thesis with the words of somebody else's PhD thesis, then you're okay, John. It's that simple. It's not like real science. You don't have to actually go out and prove anything. You just have to say, ah, oh, Miller 1956, he said it. Bingo, you've got your PhD. It's pure crap. It's pure, utter crap. It is, um, you know, if you're a pragmatist like I am, then you look at this and go, bullshit. It's bullshit, you know? Uh, what is actually going on in somebody, somebody's head? And it's a simple fact. Simple fact. The Romans had it right. If you are a male who wishes to be penetrated, then you are sexually a woman. Right? And the best thing you can possibly do is get with the plot, hit the hormones, get a frog. Because that's the way you're going to be happiest. And actually, what happens in cultures like the one I live in, is that nearly all of the, the, the people who might be you know, gay boys in the West are actually trans women, perfectly happily functioning in society as girls. It's not a problem. The HSDS here, they're not going to pretend to be boys unless, the, as Sam says, 
They have to for work. The reason they do it is mm, the job says you can't wear your hair long and you can't wear a mini dress. That's the way it is. So you have to look like a boy. That's completely different from what's happening in the West. The West is a, a deeply corrosive, it's actually a deeply corroded culture. And this comes from, from America, from the United States of America, which is basically never recovered from the trauma of its sheer existence and particularly of the, uh, the Civil War. It's just never recovered. Now, 150 years later, you still have these ludicrous schisms in society, which in part come from the, um, the Puritan basis of American thinking, which absolutely polarizes everyone. You're not allowed to be this, you're not allowed to be that. You know, you're gonna have to do this. You can't wear a beard, you know, if you wear a beard, you're gonna lose your job as a teacher. That sort of thing, well, I used to think that. And on the other hand, the, the guilt that has come from uh, slavery and the Civil War. This has never been resolved in American thinking. And as a consequence, American thought is rotten. It's putrefied. And that's why you get uh, all of these nonsenses that we see today of you know, uh, cultural appropriation, you know, microaggressions, and all the bullshit like that. It's because America is a sick, diseased society that constantly refuses to address the nature of its own sickness and cure itself. And unless, you know, any psychologist will tell you, unless you, well, any psychoanalyst will tell you, unless you address the nature of your sickness, you cannot fix it. And that is exactly what the story is with America. And that's why this um, postmodernist academic he hegemony, which is absolutely exemplified by people like Anatta, is so dangerous, it's totally corrosive. You know, we went for millennia Million, thousands of years in which males who wanted to be penetrated by other men went, I'm a girl. And that was it. That's what they did. And everybody got along fine. It's only since the 1960s that this nonsense has appeared in the West. Now, okay, I don't mind if you're, you think you're LGB. Fine. Good for you. You, you, you know, I, you plow your own furrow. Paddle your own canoe. What I am saying is, Lay the fuck off HSDS. Stop trying to brainwash them into thinking that they're actually boys. Because they're not, if they're males. And the same is true of the other way around. Now, I'm not talking here about ROGD. I'm not talking, which, by the way, is not actually gender dysphoria at all, but never mind. I'm not talking about uh, autogynophilic transvestites who do everything they can to muddy the waters and who are not transsexual. I'm talking about homosexual transsexuals. Homosexual transsexuals do not have internalized homophobia. They just want to be the, the women that they actually are, right? They don't want to adopt this mantle of politically correct gay lifestyles. They don't want to be the ones who are destabilizing the male-female binary. They love the male-female binary. They just want to be the female part of it. So what is happening here is that HSTS essentially, and men not like me, by the way, essentially iterate a conservative social viewpoint. We say, no, no, we, okay, my girlfriend is a cop, so what? <laughs> she's, she's, as far as she's concerned, and she's a girl, as far as I'm concerned, a man, it's a straightforward heterosexual relationship, and they detest this. They hate it, because it's like, oh, but you have to uh, accept your queer identity, like, fuck, I do. No, I don't, yeah, and here you see how, how twisted postmodernism is. You know, if you're within the postmodernist uh, picket fence, then yeah, you can have any standpoint you like, not a problem, but oh, wait a minute. You're not allowed to have that one because that's not an approved way of thinking. That's not an approved identity, right? So they've got something to say about it. So they're gonna shut it down. That is what's happening. Now, I think a lot of people at the moment are being damaged by a precipitate rush towards uh, transition, especially in the cases of uh, teenage girls, adolescent girls. Uh, I think they're not suffering from gender I think ROG, ROGD sufferers are not suffering from gender dysphoria. What they're suffering from is, in fact, uh, teenage body dysmorphia, which is extremely common. The effects of being spoon-fed this uh, postmodernist bullshit from teacher after teacher and through their university careers, high school careers, the whole lot of it, that all this feminist crap, and finally social media addiction. Well, you take all these three together and pile them all together, you get some very, very fucked up individuals, and that is what you're seeing. But it's not actually gender dysphoria. 
There's only one type of transsexual, and that are, those are people whose sexuality is the inverse of what would be expected for their birth sex. Right? They are transsexual. They transcend their sex. Transvestite, AGP transvestites, they're not transsexual. They're, they're, they're blokes in frocks, tiffs, tiffs in skirts. They're just guys who want to look like women for sexual, for, for the reasons of um, their sexual paraphilia. They're delusional. And it is unwise to cater to delusional people. We shouldn't be doing it. HSTS, when they transition, are becoming what they actually are. Because they're bringing, bringing their gender, that is their outward pr uh, presentation, right? their persona, in Jungian terms, into line with their sexuality. And your sexuality is everything that you are. It's everything. You know, the, I know Americans, oh no, it's not about sex. I don't care what you think. You get off your puritan puritanical boat. It's been 400 years. Get off it. Sexuality is what drives you as a human being. You only have two primary instincts, survival and sex, right? That's it. There's nothing else there. Everything you do is about sexuality. But if we're looking at HSTS, they're a very, male to female, sorry, male to feminine HSTS, they're a very, very specific group. And all we are discussing there, we're looking at a, a, a child, who, a young person who has been gender non-conforming in childhood, and nearly all HSTS were, uh, you look into their past, into their, ask them about how they were as kids, and they'll always tell you. And the point is their parents will tell you the same thing. No, you know, she was constantly dressing in her sister's clothes when she was five years old. Things like that. If they get past puberty and they haven't dropped it, then they are one of two things. That is, well, they actually are one thing, and that is transgender homosexual, right? They're transgender homosexual. There's nothing you can do about it. They will always be that. And whether they appear or not as full HSTS, because HSTS is the end of the etiology. That's the end of the de developmental scale, right? That's all it is. It's, it's the most visible and extreme form of transgender homosexuality. HSTS basically reject all of the postmodernists, the LGB, new gay man bullshit, not because they reject being homosexual, they know they're homosexual. If you ask them, they'll tell you, oh yeah, I'm homosexual, but I'm not going to be one of these people, you know? I'm just going to be a woman and get on with my life. And that is what they do. And you have to understand that people like Amitai and the others like them, people like, uh, like Zucker, and unfortunately, I think even Mike Bailey thinks this, and I really rate Mike Bailey, I think he's a very decent, honest man. They seem to have bought into this absolute bullshit. The gay lifestyle, the postmodernist LGB new gay man lifestyle, is not better. It's a, an artifact of the 1960s. If you look, any, and, and, and uniquely in West Coast America, really, if you look anywhere else in the world, anywhere through history, it doesn't apply. It's not there. Now, the postmodernists, of course, will turn around and tell you that all cultures are equivalent. There's no culture better than another culture. But what they do here, exactly what they're doing here, is saying, ah, wait a minute, but uh, LGBT culture is better than conservative traditional sexual roles. That's what they're saying. So yes again, it's the same old horse shit. You can only think what you, you can, you're only allowed to think for yourself as long as you're thinking inside the postmodernist mindset. Within the, within, inside the parameters that postmodernists set for you to think inside. And HSTS drive a coach and horses through that. They just say, fuck you you big time because we're not going to do it. We're going to hit the moans, get the dresses, do the hair and find a nice man to settle down with. They don't want to be part of some uh, culture that is famous for promiscuity, risky sexual behavior, a transmission of STDs, substance abuse, emotional abuse, you name it. You name it. They don't want any part of that. That's, that's not internalized homophobia, that's common sense. That's like, oh, why, would I, why would I be part of that when I am good enough looking to pass as a woman and I can find a man who will accept me as a woman and I can stay away from all that bullshit. But you see, the LGB is a construct of postmodernism. 
postmodernism. So the postmodernists protect it, defend it. They circle the wagons. Oh, no, 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 no. You mustn't do that. And they talk all this bullshit, this nonsense about a lifetime on hormones. You're human. You've got a lifetime on hormones, whatever you do. Fucking get used to it, you know? There's no increased risk from taking estrogen than a woman would have, you know? MTFs on estrogen have a higher risk, it's true, of breast cancer, because it's an estrogen cancer. It's in line with what women risks, women's risks are. Trans men on testosterone have an increased risk of, of a heart disease, just like natal men. What about that? What a big surprise, you know? Is this a big deal? No the hell, it's not a big deal. And then they go on to the bullshit about the surgery. Well, I'll tell you the first thing to notice is that most HSTS never have surgery. They're walking around with their cocks still on. And they just get around it, you know? Because sex is about how you pleasure each other. And, you know, they, want, they like to be penetrated anally. So that's fine. For some, that's not enough. But for most, it is. And for those who want to go the full way, then they should be allowed to do that without any nonsense. Because this is not a lifetime of surgery, as we see on, 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 on transphobic websites like Fourth Wave Now. This is one operation, one operation usually, followed by a year of uh, dilation using a thing called a stent. We're talking about to, to, to feminine here, which ensures, just like wearing a keeper if you have a pierced ear, by the way, which ensures that the whole thing doesn't heal up again. You have to do that for about a year, then after that, that's it. You live the rest of your life as a woman. You know, you take your HRT, it's the same as women do who have menopause and want to. It's not a problem. There's no problem. There's no lifetime of surgery. You don't have to keep going back to the surgeon. Once it's installed and it's working, it's installed, it's working, you leave it alone. Some surgeons, by the way, like to do the surgery in two stages. They like to do the, um, the, the, the big bits, uh, the functional parts first, let those heal up, and then come back in and detail up the, the, the labia, etc., so that they can get a better look. Others go, well, rather than have two operations, we'll just have one. The point is, after that initial one or two surgeries, that's it. You don't have to go back. As long as you're successful, your surgery has been successful, that's it. So all these arguments that are being talked about are complete bullshit. You know, you know it's just as bad. It's just as... Um, illogical and as presumptive as the kind of attitude you get from Christians. You know, they're just exactly the same. You must not do that because, you know, it doesn't suit us. That's basically what these people are saying. And they'll, they'll insult you, they'll say, oh, you're only thinking the way you do because you, uh, you like chasing trans women. Well, yeah, I do like trans women. But at the same time, thank you very much, but I do have an advanced degree myself and I have been a journalist for these last 30 years. I think I am able to look and read at the fucking literature and interpret it, that's my job. Your job is not, it is not, to try to condition people to reject their own sexuality, which is what you're trying to do. Every time you say to an, uh, an MTF, a young transgender homosexual, ah, mustn't be a, mustn't be a woman, oh, don't be feminine, you're trying to condition their sexuality. They're, you're trying to condition them to desire gay men rather than straight men. That ain't gonna work. Promise, it ain't going to work. That's exactly why you have the hundred buttons looking for a top. These people are not, there's no possible way that these people can achieve emotional sexual satisfaction with another gay. You know why? Because they regard it as a lesbian relationship. What they want is a real man, a real straight man. Right? So, we're onto you. We are definitely so onto you, you have no idea. And it's high time that people started getting in about it and saying, on behalf of the HSDS, that these people need to back off. Back right off, because we are going backwards now. You know, it's not that long ago that I thought that we reached a point where, in the West, where Young HSTS, we're just going to be able to go, right, fine, I need my, my hormones, I'm going to change, get my hair, ba-da-ba-da, ba -da, and just do it, and it wouldn't be a problem put in the way. You know, I didn't like what happened to Ken Zucker for the way that it was done. But I thought it was high bloody time something was done. Now we've got these people coming out of the woodwork, pushing their postmodernist 
hegemonistic ideas that of, of how other people should behave and run their lives. That's what they're doing. And saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. Oh, you have a penis, so you've got to be a boy. Bullshit. It's not about what your body is, it's about what your sexuality says you are. You, and you, you guys have to understand that. Every time you say to someone, oh, I can't do that, I can't be a transsexual, then you're engaging in reparative therapy, and that is immoral and unprofessional. So I think it's time that everybody got together and we started slamming these buggers and giving them a really hard time because they need it. They're pretending that they are authorities and they don't know squat. You know, you've got people here who claim that they're, oh, there's no AGPs in Southeast Asia or South America. Have they ever been to Southeast Asia or South America, I ask myself? And the answer is no, they have not. All of this nonsense is coming from their ivory towers of bullshit situated in the United States of America. And it's high time we told the whole lot of them that that's it, we've had enough of it. I mean, I want to do another, we'll do another series of lectures maybe about how can we combat postmodernism, how can we roll it back and get rid of it. But right now we're talking about the specific harm that it does to individuals. I'm sorry, I'm sweating a bit, it's very hot. And for your benefit, I don't have the air conditioning on because it makes a lot of noise. Anyway, that's it for just now. That's this rant over, but I'm absolutely fed up with these people, and I find their behaviour beneath contempt, to be quite honest with you. Beneath contempt. Anybody